Hi, I'm Kelly Kramer. And I'm Scott Zipker. Come along with us as we explore the Decorah area and the scenic Upper Iowa River on this edition of Iowa Outdoors. Coming up, we'll show you how trout aren't the only beneficiaries of farmers and government working together to improve water quality in Iowa's trout streams. We'll spend some time on just a few of the 1,800 miles of river that are found in Iowa with someone who has literally written the book on paddling Iowa. Hear the incessant buzz of the 17-year cicada and learn why entomologists and others are fascinated by this unusual insect. And we'll show you how the DNR is successfully reintroducing the trumpeter swan to Iowa and teaching an important lesson. We'll have all that and more. So sit tight, Iowa Outdoors is about to begin. Funding for Iowa Outdoors is provided by the Claude P. Small, Catherine Small Cousins and William Carl Cousins Fund at the Lincoln Way Community Foundation in Clinton County to support nature programming on Iowa Public Television. Mid-American Energy, helping to harness renewable sources of electricity through their investment in wind power. Information is available at midamericanenergy.com. Mid-American Energy, obsessively, relentlessly at your service. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on IPTV can be found in Iowa Outdoors Magazine, the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov. Trout fishing is a mainstay of tourism in Northeast Iowa, drawing anglers from all over the world. Almost since the settlement of the state, Iowa streams have been stocked to maintain a trout population. The Iowa Department of Natural Resources raises almost 150,000 trout each year here at the Decorah Fish Hatchery. Rural and urban developments over the last two centuries put pressure on trout populations. In addition to stocking programs, collaborations between farmers and government have been improving water quality in Iowa's trout streams, allowing more than fish to reap the benefits. A lone angler is fishing for trout in North Bear Creek in rural Winnesheet County in northeastern Iowa. He quietly works this section of the stream where he can relax and enjoy a few hours of solitude. It makes me feel like I'm in the mountains and I'm a long ways from work and everything else. And this is, this is one of the prettiest places I fish and I get here as often as I can. Oh, there's another one! Oh! But for Kleckner, who is president of the Driftless Chapter of Trout Unlimited, as well as a fishing guide and owner of Bear Creek Anglers, he knows each trout he catches and releases is there because a large number of people have been working together for more than 80 years. Now the wild brown trout. The trout he is catching have come from two sources the native population that swim in North Bear Creek, and stocking by the Iowa Department of Natural Resources from the nearby Decor Fish Hatchery. But the return of brown, brook, and rainbow trout to northeastern Iowa waters goes beyond the delivery of the fish to the stream by the Iowa DNR. Trout need clear, fast-moving, 50-degree Fahrenheit water and a gravel-covered stream bed to thrive and survive. The spring-fed creeks in northeastern Iowa are the perfect habitat for these fish. Rainbow and brook trout are native to the region, and brown trout were introduced in the 1880s. As farming and industrialization grew, trout numbers began to decline, and in the 1930s, work began to help bring back dwindling populations. Efforts have really been kicked into high gear during the past two decades as a strong relationship between farmers, the Iowa Department of Natural Resources, and the Federal Natural Resources Conservation Service has been forged. My experience with farmers has been that most farmers want to do the right thing. They want to do what is correct for the resource and correct for the stream that flows through their property. Now, sometimes they aren't able to do the right thing because of economic or social issues that come into play. 
And then there is that small percentage that doesn't care about doing the right thing. And unfortunately, when you're talking about trout streams that have very small watersheds, just one or two really bad fields of high erosion can have a big impact on that small stream. As you find a cooperating landowner, or as you decide that there's a piece of state property, a section of stream on state property that needs to have some rehabilitation work, you start to do that work. And as other landowners see that, they start to realize that's a, that's a good project. I want to see that happen on my property too. Since the early 1990s, projects have included seeding areas next to the stream to filter water and hold back the soil, placing riprap along the stream banks to reduce erosion, adding bank hides to give trout a place to escape from predators, and the installation of fences to keep cattle out of the water. Private contractors do much of the work, but there are some projects that only happen because of volunteer labor and donated materials. According to the DNR, anglers make more than half a million trips to Iowa trout streams and inject more than $14 million into Iowa's economy every year. Efforts by landowners, Volunteers and government agencies have helped clean up the water and keep gravel stream beds clear of silt, allowing trout to lay their eggs. Their work has helped re-establish naturally reproducing trout in more than 40 of Iowa's 105 trout streams. It is brownie. Examples of this work can be seen at Valley View Farm, where Walter Langland and his son Steve have a grain and livestock operation. In 1993, the elder Langland started the first of several restoration projects by fencing off this section of North Bear Creek to keep the cattle out of the stream. It makes me feel good that uh, someone else can enjoy fishing along a, a stream that has good access to it. Some of Langland's other projects include stream bank restoration, bank hides, and the creation of a parking area for anglers. Well, this is the Century Farm. I don't know who is going to carry on it after my wife and I and son are, are gone, but uh, we need to care for the land for the future generations. Not far away, Jason Howe runs Howland Hills Farm in rural Alamakee County. Howe sought help from the DNR more than a decade ago to help restore the land along his section of Patterson Creek near Walk-On. I was kind of tired of seeing all that good uh, topsoil washed away, and uh, so I had um, went to them and asked about it, and I, um, you know, I, I think around the same time as when I was wanting to get the trout, to see if I could get the trout to start reproducing, wondering what that would take, and uh, spoke with the DNR about that, and um, most years I'll do one or two um, of the worst uh, banks, I guess, to kind of keep them from eroding away. And, and uh, you know, it's been working out pretty good. How he spent his summer days on the creek when he was younger, and his children are continuing the tradition of fishing, swimming, and playing in the water. For Kleckner, just catching the trout tells him things are improving, as more soil remains in nearby farm fields and out of the stream. Having a pretty stream with nice rocky banks and all that sort of thing is, is important and that's nice. However, if the farmers don't take care of the 500 or 1,000 acres that they're farming that's in the watershed, uh, pretty stream banks aren't gonna help natural reproduction of brown trout. So, I mean, it's all, it's all the farmers taking care of the watershed that, that has allowed us to have natural brown trout reproduction going on here, and, and for me, that's pretty exciting. The Upper Iowa is one of the most scenic rivers in the country, and one of the most prized in Iowa. It winds its way through Howard, Winnesheek, and Alamakee counties, before eventually feeding into the Mississippi. The river is a popular spot for canoeing, kayaking, tubing, and fishing. National Geographic Adventure says canoeing the Upper Iowa is one of the top 100 adventures in North America. Adventure! Canoe outfitters can be found throughout the river valley, offering equipment and transportation for paddlers. Outdoor enthusiasts have access to several campgrounds along the shores with easy river access, and lodging in nearby towns that welcome visitors. The gorgeous views throughout Iowa's bluff country are punctuated 
by stunning wooded bluffs and limestone palisades, some rising more than 300 feet above the river's edge. The area is an ecological treasure, featuring prairies and wetlands that provide critical habitat for a variety of fish and wildlife. Nate Hogeveen, the DNR's Director of River Programs, has written this book, Paddling Iowa. It's a must-have guide of resources and access points for Iowa's 1,800 miles of rivers. You're doing a good job up there, Kelly. Hogeveen says there's plenty of diversity along Iowa's waterways. And because there's something new around each bend, being on the river should float just about anyone's boat. like fun, doesn't it? But what appears to be child's play is actually serious rescue training for whitewater kayakers. That said, Nate Hogevane, a freelance writer and recreational consultant, is having and does have fun whenever he's near water. I'm all over the map. I like everything about paddling. So one day it's solitude. Another day it's adventurous whitewater paddling. Another day it's uh, enjoying time on the river with, with friends. There, there's just so much that, that the rivers can give us. That may help explain why Nate jumped at the opportunity to spend more than 100 days exploring 1,800 river miles in preparation for writing Paddling Iowa. I wanted to share information about Iowa's rivers with Iowans. I wanted for people who live here to understand that they don't necessarily need to drive halfway across the country in order to have a wonderful, wild experience. Paddling Iowa is divided into day trips that range from approximately 3 to 20 miles on 34 of Iowa's rivers and lakes. The guide offers information on river access, water levels, camping opportunities, historical points of interest, maps, and other important aspects of the paddling culture. Nate also takes every opportunity to emphasize safety as part of a great paddling experience. Water is, you know, something that inherently we can't breathe in. So you want to, you want to stay on the surface, <laughs> and just uh, just make sure that that um, that you kind of know what some of the hazards are, so that you can be aware of them. And most of them are pretty easily avoidable once you know what they are. Learning about potential hazards seemed like the perfect excuse for a river trip. Nate agreed, so we packed up our kayaks and headed to the Des Moines River. Well, Nate, what should we be thinking about in terms of safety before we even get in the water? Well, the, the one thing that we're doing right so far is we're wearing our personal flotation devices, um, and that's, that's just extremely important. Um, that, that way you can float even if you're not conscious, if, if your kayak happens to flip over. Yeah. I also noticed that we're putting in below this dam here. Is that really important? That's extremely important. What happens with the low head dam is that there's recirculating hydraulics underneath the water that can really hold a person down under the water. They're exceedingly dangerous and they, they do kill paddlers, unfortunately. So it's a great idea to take out well upstream of a dam if you come upon one, portage clear around it, and put in well downstream of the dam. Okay, well let's get in the water and talk about some other stuff. Already. Thanks. Nate continued his safety lesson by pointing out snags, eddies, and other tangible features that can spell trouble on the water. He also pointed out that Iowa's riverways are among its few remaining native landscapes. As such, he believes they are something of a treasure. I really don't think we experience the true Iowa from a car. When we get on a river, things just completely change. Your mindset changes, your view of the world changes. You're at the bottom of a river valley looking up. You're surrounded by trees and woods and, and wildlife all of a sudden. Um, these, these corridors are just, just magical places. Nate's appreciation of Iowa's rivers has heightened his awareness of the challenges they face. So how would you evaluate the health of this particular river? Um, it's kind of kind of mid-pack in the range of, you know, if it's not one of the, the most disturbed rivers and it's, it's not one of the best. Um, but, uh, you know, it still has a, a fair amount of nutrients, uh, nitrates and, and such. 
seeing the rivers and in some cases what happens to them uh, leads me to be a very conservation-minded person, especially concerning water quality. I think that as Iowans we can do a much better job of, of protecting our rivers. Despite Nate's concerns, his guidebook showcases Iowa as a great place to paddle. Before I started the guidebook, um, I was in Madison, Wisconsin at a big canoeing expo, and uh, I was talking to the author of a guy who's written guidebooks on Wisconsin and Illinois, and a fellow overheard us, and he said, you're working on a, a guidebook for rivers in Iowa? What for? <laughs> I looked at him and I said, we've got plenty of good rivers here in Iowa. Like the breathtakingly beautiful Upper Iowa, with its looming limestone cliffs and wooded corridors, where Nate and I paddled for two hours one chilly fall morning. The swallow's nests and stands of balsam firs, even a huge eagle's nest, add to the magic of this world-class river. Nate hopes his book will raise awareness of the breadth of paddling experiences in the state. You know, there's anything from very tranquil experience on a slow river, or, you know, some lakes are, are very wonderful little tranquil experiences too. Then it ranges to, you know, large bodies of water like Lake Red Rock or, or some of the places on the Mississippi, to these uh, wonderful little rocky streams that, that have, have very adventurous whitewater in them. Novices can find help getting started at sessions like this one at Gray's Lake in Des Moines. There's a saying that we've been using more frequently lately that um, paddling with, with two friends makes a rescue and, and uh, paddling with one friend makes a witness. It's a really good idea to, to, to paddle with uh, people who are more experienced than you are, especially when you're first starting out. Once a beginner feels more confident about paddling, he or she might want to participate in one of the many projects around the state that combine conservation and fun. As it happens, the DNR is doing Project AWARE, um, which is now drawing, you know, up to 200 paddlers and more uh, for a week-long trip down an Iowa River and pulling enormous amounts of trash out of some of our rivers. Nate readily admits he's on a mission to increase the number of paddlers in the state and the quality of their paddling experiences. At the deepest level, he seems motivated by the belief that a few hours on the water can lead to the best kind of natural high. I'm looking for that, that fix, you know. We all work these jobs, and uh, when, you, when you sit at a, a desk for a long time, you start to get in a frame of mind where, you know, where the mundane seems to be everything, but you get out on a river and that just all goes away instantly. How many things can do that for a person? If you've been outdoors lately, you may have heard the incessant buzz of the 17-year cicadas. It's almost deafening in some wooded areas. The periodical cicada is one of the most fascinating insects, spending all but a few weeks of its life underground, emerging to mate, reproduce, and begin the 17-year cycle all over again. Take a listen. It's the summer sound of cicadas, 17 years in the making. All of a sudden, they emerge at the same time. And after that long, it's amazing that they're able to synchronize all that. And so it's really a unique occurrence that's happening uh, right now. We have waited for this event, we have waited for this to happen for 17 years. These insects are brood three of the periodical cicadas. They're found primarily in central, south central, and southeastern Iowa. There are other broods of periodical cicadas that emerge in other years. And there are annual cicadas we see and hear every year. These periodical cicadas are related, but they are different species than the annual cicadas, and they only appear periodically. The body is smaller, the periodical cicadas are black, the wings have red or have orange veins, 
and then they have these bright red beady eyes. So they look different and they're on a different schedule. The periodical cicadas are here in June and July and they sing during the daytime. The annual cicadas are here from July to frost and they sing in the evening. Female cicadas lay eggs. Those eggs hatch into nymphs, which fall to the ground and then burrow themselves down into the dirt and attach to tree roots. They stay there feeding on sap from the tree root for 17 years before digging their way up to the surface. And then they go through the miracle of metamorphosis where the insect actually crawls out of its own skin. So a crack forms down the back of the insect, the cicada shell opens up, and the insect pulls itself out. You can sometimes see piles of their hardened shells at the base of trees or on plants. And in the tree, the males sing. They do that with a drum on the side of their abdomen. The males are singing. That's a, a signal to the female that I'm over here. Um, and once the female is mated, she lays eggs, and we start the cycle over. You'll find periodical cicadas primarily in native woodlands or in areas with older tree populations. There can be a million and a half periodical cicadas per acre, and as many as 40,000 of them in a single tree. And it has been a full out chorus everywhere in the park of the cicadas um, calling to try to find a mate. And it is, can be very loud in certain areas. And, uh, and sometimes with my coworkers, we almost have to shout to each other uh, in some places because they're just so loud. Just the singing of all those tens of thousands of male cicadas is annoying to people who have to be around it all the time. These insects are mostly harmless. They will not bite or sting, and they pose little threat to plants or trees. They do not have chewing mouth parts, and they feed only on tree sap. Not damaging to crops, not harmful to people. It's an insect that almost everybody can love. The rare, unusual characteristics of this long-living insect are fascinating to entomologists. We could almost sell tickets and bill it as a tourist attraction because there are people who are fascinated by cicadas, there are people who are fascinated by insects. I was here when the grandparents of these cicadas emerged back in 1980, and it was such a phenomenon to see then that I couldn't wait for it to happen again in 1997. Here I am in 2014, seeing them again. I hope I'm around to see it one more time in 2031. Since the periodical cicadas only come around every 17 years, you can look at them two different ways. If you like them, get out and look, listen, and enjoy them while you can. Or, if they annoy you, take comfort in knowing that they'll soon be gone and won't be seen or heard for another 17 years. Trumpeter swans were once common in Iowa, but by the late 1800s, they were gone from the state. About 20 years ago, the DNR began a program to restore the population of trumpeter swans, and today, those efforts are paying off. On a cool morning in May, Dave Hoffman of the DNR prepares to give a presentation on trumpeter swans to school kids at Summit Lake near Creston. Using the topic of swans as a springboard, Hoffman seizes the opportunity to talk about a serious issue in Iowa, water quality. In a way, it gives the kids uh, a connection to our environment, to our wetlands, and we talk about the importance of wetlands, swans, and just our landscape in general. The show ends with the release of four trumpeter swans donated from zoos across the country and communities in Iowa. The hope is that the swans will settle here and nest, helping restore a population of birds that was almost wiped out at the turn of the 20th century. Hoffman is part of a program started in the mid-90s to help replenish the trumpeter swan population. The program was designed to use trumpeter swans as ambassadors to bring attention to the importance of wetlands, not only for wildlife habitat, but for water quality and flood control as well. Swans generally settle in wetlands with high water quality and strong plant growth to support their diet. The swans typically pick out the best sites with the best water quality out there and choose those sites. Those sites typically then have the cleanest water, have some of the best plant growth, and once you have the best plants, you have the bugs and the other things that they need there as well. 
The trumpeter swan was missing from the Iowa landscape for nearly 100 years, after most of their wetland habitat was drained for use as farmland. They were also hunted for their prized feathers and as a food source during the time of settlement, leading to near extinction in the lower 48 states. All right, one, two, three. Almost 20 years after the restoration program began, swans are making a comeback. 17 states, as far west as Colorado and as far east as Virginia, as well as two Canadian provinces, reported seeing swans that were numbered and released from Iowa. As the program flourishes, it's drawing spectators and visitors from afar. And that translates into tourism revenue that is benefiting Iowa communities. People from several different states and several hundred miles come to view swans, take pictures, and so there is the economic part of the wildlife viewing, but there's also the part where I believe as far as the quality of life. With tourism comes awareness, not only for a vital resource and the trumpeter swan, but the delicate balance they share together. That wraps up this edition of Iowa Outdoors. Be sure to check out our more than 90 features of Iowa's outdoor environments and recreational opportunities at iptv.org slash Iowa Outdoors. For now, we'll leave you with some more images of the beautiful Upper Iowa River near Decorah. my religion. <laughs> Funding for Iowa Outdoors is provided by the Claude P. Small, Catherine Small Cousins, and William Carl Cousins Fund at the Lincoln Way Community Foundation in Clinton County to support nature programming on Iowa Public Television. Mid-American Energy, helping to harness renewable sources of electricity through their investment in wind power. Information is available at midamericanenergy.com. Mid-American Energy, obsessively, relentlessly at your service. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on IPTV can be found in Iowa Outdoors Magazine, the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov.